generation so that we get off of the dinosaur era fossil fuel economy. And, you know, it is, in a sense, a Pandora's box because all of these are part of a central operating system, if you want to look at it that way, of, of the transdimensional physics and consciousness that's been kept secret uh, for various reasons. Some of them are religious and some of them are um, economic and geopolitical. And, of course, uh, all of that has to do with science and technology because, uh, let's face it, one, one civilization's miracle is another civilization's daily routine. Yeah. To that, well, this whole new science of consciousness is, is evolving. That's what the, my book is about, trying to explain what is the nothing from which everything arises out of, is sustained by, and merges back into. Because physics and modern science focuses on the change, but all change rises from the changeless. From latent potential to patent expression, we see things appear to arise out of nothing. But nothing is the something from which everything is supported and directed by. And that's, that's what we're peering into now. That's the new science. Exactly. Well, and, and of course, people, pioneers like Dr. John at Princeton and others have done studies where they have proven that consciousness and thought moving through a field of consciousness is actually non-local, that, you know, uh, the, the sort of the traditional um, reductionist, materialist view of, of this is that you're conscious because you have a collective aggregate critical mass of neurons firing and there's a and uh it's it's all it comes from the material brain but in reality the primal the the, the thing that is first is uh, primacy exists with the awareness and consciousness itself which then steps down through various dimensions into thought and astral and tonality and causality and into then linear space time and um, I wrote a paper back in the mid 1990s about this um, called the crossing point of light and in it um, discussed in great detail how from consciousness and uh, the e emergence of tonality and the sound component of thought, which is what a mantra is, by the way, um, you not only have these meditative experiences, but that's also how linear space-time is manifesting from the unbounded absolute field of nothingness, which is not nothingness. It's the allness and fullness of pure conscious being. And uh, the meditative experience, uh, the samadhi experience, is really an individual becoming quiet and centered and calm to where they begin to experience and actualize and realize that state within themselves. And when they do, then they're really prepared to be an ambassador uh, from Earth to these other civilizations because all these other civilizations have had to understand this in order to escape the limits of the box of three-dimensional space-time and the speed of light. But once you transcend space and time and 3D uh, speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, that means you have crossed into the, what I call the crossing point of light, where you're in these other dimensions, which are increasingly self-aware and conscious and thought-directed as opposed to uh, linear, and they are increasingly non-local. So absolute non-locality would be the unbounded absolute state of mind. But with between that and a fixed point in space-time, there are degrees of non-locality. And this is where things get really interesting in terms of experience and science. And that's where the wellspring of understanding is for all these so-called cities uh, and various abilities and powers and mysterious experiences people have had over the thousands of years of human history. Uh, but this is now beginning to be understood very thoroughly and scientifically, and there are some pretty elegant experience, experiments that have been done uh, at major universities that have proven the fact that the mind is, in fact, in an omnipresent field and that thought can even affect random number generators and, and biological systems and uh, physical systems. And uh, so this is really an exciting period we're in right now because I really do believe that once we can finally disclose all the information about the new energy and propulsion systems that have been kept secret by a cabal of 
uh, narcissistic and misanthropic fools that are running the earth into the ground. Once we can get that behind us, which is what we're working desperately to do, we can then begin to focus on the real task at hand of the new era, which is the development of the science of consciousness, because that's what's really exciting. Well spoke. So uh, what are your other thoughts about uh, your own experiences in consciousness and how that might pertain to these other civilizations? Have you had more experience with that, Stephen? Oh, yeah. Well, this is what I teach. I mean, the whole essence of the self born Institute is to address people that are in the process of enlightening. They've already awakened to the point where they know that they're awakening. And the point is, how do you get to those trans-dimensional states? And so I've fortunate to learn, like you, from a master that really did know it, and showed me not just an understanding, but showed me how to get there. How do you move into states? What we do with our Shakti is we actually attune people over our, whether it's in person or over the phone, we'll actually move the energy, the vibrant, the frequency and energy that someone is at will shift during our time together, so they will experience going into higher states and eventually into trans-dimensional um, reality, and that's what's really, that's what I always wanted as a kid growing up. When I started meditating and doing my mantras and my yoga for years and years. I started when I was five. I mean, I was really into this at an early age. But those kind of uh, transdimensional experiences were were a little bit fleeting in the beginning, and I, I right. always wanted to find out. Well, how do you stay there? It's like wow, I went into this profound bliss or awareness and. Now I'm still as neurotic as I was the day before. What happened? How did I, how did I get into it and then out of it again? So that's the beauty of having a master show you. You know, if you learn to tune into these higher states, it's almost like you adapt to it, or you, 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 uh, your body gets used to it. It's like it becomes the default state you live in. And so this is how we're trying to take this science and how would you put it, Put how the rubber meets the road. How do you actually bring it into the world? How do you make it real? How do you not just understand it? Because there's a big been there, done that, I know this already, in the minds of millions of people, but yet they're not living in a full illuminated state, and it's because they haven't learned how to connect to the part of them that already is. Right. And right. so our perception isn't we're, we're not trying to get to some place we think we need to be, but we're trying to tune into what we already are innately anyway. Right. And, and what we are, everybody else is. So when you realize the nature of yourself, you realize the nature of God in everyone else and in everything else, everywhere, all the time. And there really isn't any differentiation. Like you said, there's one, one mind, one consciousness that's just expressing itself through this apparent multiplicity. So we are like cells in the body of God. These, these forms of ours that come and go, it doesn't really matter, be, just like the cells in our body come and go. We don't think of a skin cell flakes off because a new one's already taken its place. And within our own consciousness, the fullness is already existent. And the illusion is that we're separate from that reality. Right. Remember, and, and that's why... the choir here. Yeah. But, well, no. But we're sharing this with other folks and thousands of people who are listening. And I think that this is... One, one, this is why when we, we go out into the stars together, uh, you know, there is a certain amount of training for astronomy that we do and also using the uh, the lasers and using the cameras and using the, the imaging systems we have in the night vision. But this, the thing that we're still doing day and night when we're on these expeditions is really an ex a very deep experience in meditation and having people uh, have these breakthroughs. A number of people who've come who have spent 20 years going to various meditation retreats have reported that when they do this with a group and it's this intensive program for a week, they actually have experiences like they never have had and then they stay with it so that they can continue to do this work uh, and stay in a stabilized state of deeper consciousness and easily travel amongst these dimensions and to other star systems. Uh, and they been, begin to understand that this is just the natural state uh, that our conscious mind is always in an omnipresent field and that with just a gentle use of intent, you can see a distant star system or the other side of the planet or you can gaze a bit into the future or know something that happened in the past, that these are all uh, abilities that are innate to every human being and not to the so-called gurus and, and mystics and what have you, that this is something that all civilizations actually report 
Um, the, the, what we have to do as a people, however, is move to the next level where we, we understand this is the new normal and uh, that the development of, of higher states of consciousness and these abilities uh, should be as normal as learning to read and write and that it's, it's, a, it's a birthright of every single human to understand this and, and be able to experience it. And it's actually a prerequisite for becoming an interstellar civilization where everyone on the planet understands this. And this is why this, this concept of an age of, of real enlightenment on this planet is so key to us becoming interplanetary because you cannot develop uh, the one without the other. Exactly. Well, here you are playing your part, and I'm playing mine and others are. It's kind of exciting, isn't it, to see people from so many different places. It's, sort of like, it's like it's happening organically or intuitively and innately rather than hierarchically, as it was exactly. in the last yuga. So that's another sign of the new yuga. Well, it is, and I get asked almost every single uh, interview every day, uh, uh, when is disclosure going to happen? I'm going, well, we're doing it now. And they go, well, no. what do you mean? Everyone's expecting an authority figure like the President of the United States to get up and make some pronouncement. I go, no, 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 no. That's not how this is happening. And this shocks people because people are so wedded to that sort of right. patriarchy. And I'm going, well, the reality is there are two realities. One is that we have put together the information at disclosureproject.org for anyone who's able to read and write and look at a video to understand that all this is real. But number two, it needs to happen with the new social media from person to person, through Twitter, through Facebook, through uh, your emails, through a video, through what have you, um, which is how we're doing this film uh, serious because that's being done only crowdfunded by the public. It's going to be released uh, in a number of ways. It's not just going to be you know something where we strike a deal with one uh, studio to release it. It's going to be in multiple platforms at once, although that's still being looked at. Um, and one of the things that, that people have to understand is, is that the technologies that exist right now didn't exist five years ago to do this. And whether it's streaming on your iPhone or your, your smartphone or, or your, your iPad or, or tablet or computer or what have you, there's so many ways to get information out um, and that it's very, very decentralized. And that uh, so, so the reality is that we're, we're at this point of emergence where all these, uh, you know, in my autobiography is called Hidden Truths, Forbidden Knowledge. All these hidden truths and all this forbidden knowledge can come out by all of us together doing it, one person to another to another to another. Yep. The other thing to realize is that the president doesn't know anything. I mean, you know, someone asked me. I was having the it, <laughs> straw man. We had one of our daughters getting, uh, you know, uh, married this past weekend, and we and, and we were in Washington, and I'm meeting with some people, um, and uh, afterwards, and someone asked me about this about uh, the president, and I said, look. The president has the briefing we put together for him. It's not as if because you're the president of the United States, you can call someone in and get a briefing on all this stuff because it's compartmented. It's an illegal operation that's been illegal since 1954, 55, uh, 56, that time frame. And the president is basically not going to be told anything that they don't want him to know. So everyone has this mistaken idea that somehow there's some sort of omniscience and omnipotence that goes along with the presidency. And, and, and similarly with the head of the United Nations or all these sort of figureheads, and, and because I've been the guy that's been at briefings with all these sort of folks, occasionally you meet someone in those high circles who is part of this sort of cabal that's been working and keeping the secret. But those are the exception. I'd say out of a 100 top people that you would think of on your just random association, think of who would be top people in the world, maybe one or two of them know anything about this subject and have worked it in any classified fashion. And, of course, I wouldn't have believed that in, 19, in the 90s when I was asked to brief uh, the CIA director what I realized, you know, at first I got this, I mean, this is kind of a hilarious story. A lot of people have, don't know this story, but I was sent a, a FedEx by a man who was friends with the CIA director, and he said, you know, um, the CIA director would like for you to come, and you're going to be the first person to brief this CIA director and, and the Clinton administration uh, on, on this subject. 
And I laughed. I looked to my wife, and I just laughed. I said, oh, yeah, right. They're just wanting to pick my brain. Um, because I thought they were just, you know, old spooks. And, you know, uh, well, we got to this meeting, and honest to God, the CIA director knew nothing. He was in, He was shaken to his core. Uh, he was virtually in tears by 